Now it is time for the last word with Lawrence O'Donnell. Good evening, Lawrence. Good evening, Alex. Uh, as with your hour, it's uh, Arizona night here at the last word. We have uh, Governor Katie Hobbs joining us. We have Senate candidate Ruben Gallego joining us. Such an important day uh, in Arizona and for the country and what happened there today. 1864. Mm -hmm. When you think of the Republican Party, think 1864. Yeah, that's where we are. Have Thank a good show. You. Thank you, Alex. Thank you. Well, Arizona has a longer history as part of Spain than it does as part of the United States. The name Arizona is thought to be a blend of Spanish and a local tribal language, meaning small spring. Arizona spent 300 years as part of Spain, beginning in 1521. Then, in 1821, when Mexico won its independence from Spain, Arizona began its short history as part of the independent country of Mexico. The United States seized all of the most valuable parts of Mexico, including California, as our prize for winning the Mexican-American War in 1848. As an American territory, Arizona chose the wrong side of the Civil War and fought to keep enslaved people in the United States enslaved. Toward the end of the Civil War, President Lincoln appointed a 54-year-old New Yorker, William Thompson Howell, as a federal judge to serve in the Arizona Territory, where he then wrote the first laws of Arizona to be written without Spanish or Mexican influence. Those laws became known as the Howell Code. One of the laws in the Howell Code written in 1864 says, a person who provides supplies or administers to a pregnant woman or procures such woman to take any medicine, drugs, or substance, or uses or employs any instrument or other means, whatever, with intent thereby to procure the miscarriage of such woman, unless it is necessary to save her life, shall be punished by imprisonment in the state prison for not less than two years, nor more than five years. Arizona was the last of the 48 contiguous states to become a state. 48 years after, William Thompson Howell wrote the abortion law of the territory, which was never rewritten by the new state of Arizona, and so remained the law of Arizona until Roe versus Wade was decided in 1973. And now, thanks to Donald Trump, the Howell Code is officially the law on abortion once again in Arizona after the Arizona State Supreme Court today ruled that the 160-year-old law is now back in force, in full force, after Donald Trump's appointees on the United States Supreme Court overturned Roe versus Wade. Donald Trump said yesterday that this is exactly what he's always wanted. Donald Trump said that each state should determine abortion law of that state. And whatever they decide must be the law of the land, in this case, the law of the state. The law of the state. And in this case, the law written by one man 54 years before women had the right to vote. Five years in prison. Donald Trump supports five years in prison for anyone in Arizona who participates in any way in an abortion. No one in Arizona has voted for that law, but a majority of the people of Arizona have voted for a governor who opposes that law, a governor to the horror of William Thompson Howell is a woman who will be our first guest tonight. It is a dark day in Arizona. Just now, the Arizona Supreme Court issued its opinion in Planned Parenthood v. Mays, upholding one of the most extreme abortion bans in the country. To the people across Arizona who are concerned about the future of abortion rights in our state, who are worried about their bodily autonomy, who don't want to see the freedom of their wives, sisters, and daughters restricted, 
You can make your concerns known at the ballot box, and I encourage you to do so. Governor Kitty Hobbs ran against Republican Carrie Lake, who fully supported an abortion ban in that campaign. Carrie Lake is now running for Senate in Arizona against Democrat Ruben Gallego, who will also be joining us tonight. And today, Carrie Lake, like other Republicans, flip-flopped on the issue. And Carrie Lake is suddenly saying something very different about abortion, which we'll hear about when Congressman Gallego joins our discussion. Immediately after the Arizona Supreme Court's decision came down, the Vice President of the United States said this. Today, the Arizona Supreme Court issued a ruling that creates a near total abortion ban in the state of Arizona, a ban with no exceptions for rape and incest, a ban that will apply to women before they even know they are pregnant, and threatens prison time for nurses and doctors. Understand, to stop bans like this, we need a United States Congress that will restore the protections of Roe v. Wade. And when they do, President Joe Biden will sign it into law. Arizona's Attorney General, Democrat Chris Mays, said today she will not enforce the law written 160 years ago by a man who could never have imagined that a woman would be Arizona's Attorney General. Attorney General Mays said, Today's decision to reimpose a law from a time when Arizona wasn't a state, the Civil War was raging, and women couldn't even vote, will go down in history as a stain on our state. I look forward to the people of Arizona having their say in the matter. And let me be completely clear, as long as I am Attorney General, no woman or doctor will be prosecuted under this draconian law in this state. Today, Arizona State Senator Eva Birch said this. Good morning. I am State Senator Eva Birch. A couple weeks ago, I had an abortion, a safe, legal abortion here in Arizona for a pregnancy that I very much wanted, a pregnancy that failed, like many of my pregnancies before it, an embryo that was dying and a miscarriage that was destined to happen. Somebody took care of me. Somebody gave me a procedure so that I wouldn't have to experience another miscarriage, the pain, the mess, the discomfort. And now we're talking about whether or not we should put that doctor in jail. This is outrageous that we would even dignify the consideration of this type of ban, a ban drafted when women had no say, when Arizona was not a state. This isn't what the people of Arizona or the people of this country want. We're talking about a small number of really extreme political leaders calling the shots for everybody else. Republicans don't want this. Independents don't want this. Democrats don't want this. We have to look at who our elected leaders are. The time is now. It's done. I've had enough. The people of Arizona have had enough. We are electing pro-choice candidates in November. Watch it happen. That's all I have to say. Leading off our discussion tonight is Arizona Governor Katie Hobbs. Governor, thank you very much for joining us on this important night. I know how busy uh, and difficult a day this has been for you. And I just wanted to get your reaction about what it felt like to be standing behind Senator Birch when you heard her tell that story and realizing that if that story, if this were two weeks from now, she would not be able to tell that story. Well. Arizonans across the state are reeling from this decision, and I know that uh, stories like Senator Birch's are much more common than most people realize. And the devastating impact of this ban that it will have on health care for women across the state is just unconscionable. 
Uh, as you described, this is a ban from 1864 that was enacted before we were a state, before women had the right to vote, and has extreme uh, measures that prevent abortion, even in cases of rape or incest, that have no regard for complications of pregnancy and requires jail time for doctors. This is an outrageous ban, and it's why I immediately called on the legislature to repeal this ban. And not only repeal this ban, but to enact protection for IVF and guarantee access to contraception. But Arizonans also are going to have the chance to weigh in on this in November and enshrine the right to abor abortion in our state's constitution through a ballot measure. And as governor, I'm going to do everything I can to ensure that that ballot measure passes. And I would urge folks to join us at ArizonaForAbortionAccess.org. So, uh, as you know, uh, Carrie Lake, who was running against you for governor, fully supported this ban, f fully supported this law coming into effect, uh, if it was going to. Uh, today, she now says she opposes it. And her bright idea today is that Governor Hobbs has to solve the problem. She said this is now your problem to solve. Mm -hmm. Well, look, this is just nothing but political opportunism on her part. And any other politician who supported this ban, politicians who celebrated the Dobbs decision, which paved the way for today's decision, uh, and, and Arizonans are going to have the opportunity to hold these folks accountable in November. Um, as you heard from the senator's remarks, uh, every legislator in Arizona uh, is up for election in November. And every single Republican in our state's legislature voted for a fetal personhood bill that I was fortunately able to veto last year, but would have paved the way for an Alabama-style ruling that bans IVF in Arizona. And uh, these folks are on the record supporting this ban, and they can't walk away from that now. Uh, the state Supreme Court in their ruling said, literally, physicians are now on notice that all abortions, except those necessary to save a woman's life, are illegal. Uh, physicians are now on notice. What can you tell the physicians, the nurses, the healthcare workers? Uh, in Arizona, and any family member or friend who might ever drive a woman to an appointment with her physician? Well, again, this is just an outrageous uh, decision uh, that puts so much, uh, so many Arizona women in harm's way. Um, we know for the next 45 days that uh, the 15 week ban that Arizona has is in place. Uh, but with, but after that, without further action from the court, uh, this total ban will be the law of Arizona. I hope the legislature does the right thing and does what I've called on them to do and repeals this ban, because we're already seeing the level of chaos and confusion uh, that, that this is causing. Uh, and uh, Arizonans need access to health care. Doctors and health care providers need to be able to provide the health care that their patients need and not fear the repercussions of going to jail for doing that. What does it do to life in Arizona when people wake up one day and they don't have the rights they had the day before? Well, um, you heard the senator's story. We heard another story from a woman this morning with pregnancy complications uh, that required abortion care and uh, was not able to get it in Arizona, even though the procedure she was needed was not outlawed. Uh, but their stories are are there. There's thousands of those stories across Arizona, and nobody should have to justify an abortion, and nobody should have to worry about being able to get the care they need if they're pregnant. Uh, and we have to repeal this ban so that uh, these women's lives are not at risk. And for the voters of Arizona, it, will they have the possibility of seeing this on the ballot as something that they can vote on? Absolutely. As I mentioned, we will have a, a constitutional measure on the ballot to enshrine abortion in our Constitution. And I uh, 
am, am glad Arizonans are going to have the opportunity to have their voice heard on this. Uh, it is a common-sense measure. Uh, access to abortion is supported by the vast majority of Arizonans, and I'm confident that it will pass. And as governor, I'm going to do everything that I can to help make sure that it does. Uh, meanwhile, it seems you're headed for almost a year, at least, even if that passes, uh, of people living under this uh, 1864 law. I'm incredibly concerned about what happens between now and November uh, and when this uh, uh, measure goes into law. And that's why the legislature needs to repeal this 1864 ban uh, now. They could do it tomorrow if they wanted to. And I hope that they do the right thing. Arizona Governor Katie Hobbs, thank you very much for joining us on this important night. Thank you. Thank you. And joining us now is Alexis McGill Johnson, president and CEO of Planned Parenthood. Planned Parenthood of Arizona was the plaintiff in that case that was decided by the Arizona Supreme Court. Uh, what are you telling uh, people in Arizona and Planned Parenthood in Arizona to do tomorrow and in the coming days? Well, in the coming days, they still will be able to get access. As you know, this doesn't go uh, in, into effect for for a bit. But uh, what we are feeling and hearing is exactly the outrage, the enraging uh, feelings that we just saw from uh, the governor, from uh, Senator Birch, as she told her very personal private story about her own uh, abortion experience and the idea that Arizona has taken its citizens back to 1864, 160 years of, you know, essentially taking away an essential right to freedom. That's the conversation that we're having with Arizonans right now, letting them know that we will be there to support them wherever they need to go. I'm thinking about all my colleagues who are going to see the influx of patients in California, and Colorado, and New Mexico, and also thinking about the fight that needs to be like lit under fire in Arizona for all of those folks who need to understand that this did not need to happen. There's no reason why we are here right now. But that this court felt that they could put providers of health care on notice for providing the very care that Senator Birch needed is just astounding to us. Yeah, that line in the opinion saying physicians are now on notice, that means Planned Parenthood is now on notice. They're saying that directly to you, that you are now on notice uh, in the state of Arizona. How did it feel to read that line in the decision? Well, we're, we're always on notice and we're always a, a target because not only do we provide a uh, full spectrum of reproductive health care, we also fight to defend it. And, you know, and so being on notice is, you know, quite frankly, it's it's an honor. It's a badge of honor because I know that we are on the right side of history. We're on the right side of, of doing what we need to, to support care. And at the same time, I also know that, you know, these providers are people, right? These are providers and, you know, patients and frontline workers. And as you mentioned, friends and family who are you know, driving people to uh, appointments and, and, and across state lines to, to get access to care. They're very real people on the other side of each of these stories. And uh, to, to talk about the potential criminalization of, of people who are just helping other people, you know, do what the majority of people believe is a private medical decision, uh, again, is just incredibly outrageous. And I think that's what we need to continue to uh, to share with people, to help them understand that there's no reason that we are in this in this situation here. You know, we look at what's happening in Arizona. Just last week, we saw what happened in Florida, and uh, you know, continuing to watch uh, the doubling down on taking away reproductive freedom at a time when Americans are telling you every single day that they want these protections just seems so uh, so backwards to me. Alexis McGill Johnson, president of Planned Parenthood, thank you very much for joining us on this important night. Thank you. Thank you. And coming up, the only person standing between Republican Carrie Lake and the United States Senate in Arizona is our next guest, Congressman Ruben Gallego, now the Democratic candidate for Senate 
in Arizona. Ruben Gallego joins us next. Two years ago, when Roe versus Wade was overturned, Arizona Republican Carrie Lake said that she was incredibly thrilled that Arizona would now be ruled by a law written by William Thompson Howell 48 years before Arizona became a state. I'm incredibly thrilled that we are going to have a great law that's already on the books, so it will prohibit abortion in Arizona, and I think we're going to be paving the way and setting course for other states to follow. Incredibly thrilled, a great law. She called it a great law, written in 1864. Carrie Lake is now the Republican candidate for Senate in Arizona, and she's no longer willing to say what she said two years ago, what you just heard her say. In fact, now she's saying the exact opposite. Carrie Lake released a statement saying, quote, I oppose today's ruling, and I am calling on Katie Hobbs and the state legislature to come up with an immediate common sense solution that Arizonans can support. So that's Carrie Lake calling on the woman who defeated her for governor, Katie Hobbs, to solve the problem created by Donald Trump and his appointees to the United States Supreme Court overturning Roe versus Wade. In that same written statement, Carrie Lake said that she will oppose federal bans on abortion. Joining us now is the one person standing between Carrie Lake and the United States Senate, Democratic Congressman Ruben Gallego of Arizona. He is now the Democratic candidate for the United States Senate in Arizona. <laughs> Congressman Gallego, thank you very much for joining us on this very important Good night. Evening. You are now dealing with a Republican opponent who has completely changed her position on this very law, which she once said she was incredibly <laughs> thrilled that that law was going to go into effect. Right. Well, she, she changed her opinion, but it doesn't make the danger any less to the women of Arizona. Right now, in 2024, the women of Arizona have the same rights as the women uh, in Arizona of 1864. Just, just think about that. My daughter, my nine-month your old daughter has less rights than my wife did growing up, than my sisters, than my mom did growing up. Uh, and you have flip-floppers like Carrie Lake who want to say whatever they can just to get power. And then they expect us to trust them once again that they're not going to put an abortion ban in, but they're going to do everything they can uh, that, to even protect the rights that we already have, what, what is still left for people uh, and women in Arizona. So. This is a horrible situation. Uh, you know, I've been getting calls all day from, uh, you know, people in Arizona, women in Arizona, uh, who just feel like they have been attacked, and they have been. Uh, you know, politicians like Carrie Lake have put this state in danger, put the, the, the health of women in danger for power, and now they're trying to run away from it. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's time uh, to pay the toll. And uh, they're, they're going to pay for it in November. Well, of course, Carrie Lake did not say what her new position on abortion actually is or what the new policy should be. She wants uh, Governor Katie Hobbs and the late legislature to decide that for her. She apparently has no suggestions about it. Let's listen to something more that she said about this law two years ago uh, in 2022, uh, when she also said sure. she does not believe in abortion. Let's listen to this. I don't believe in abortion. I think the older law is going to take a, an, is going to go into effect. That's what I believe will happen. I yeah. don't think abortion pills should be legal. Uh, that seems very clear, uh, Congressman Gallego. And uh, as of tonight, uh, she seems to be very afraid of what she has said in the past. She is lying, Lawrence. In other instances, she said it's called a great law. In other times, she actually cited by the actual statute number, uh, that uh, law that basically uh, outright bans abortion and uh, criminalizes uh, providers like doctors and nurses, and now she's trying to run away from it. How can we trust someone like this? How can we trust someone who calls something a great law, who celebrated it uh, when, when it passed? Celebrate taking the right of a woman to control her body, the right of a family to make these very hard decisions with their doctor and not or all of a sudden we're supposed to trust them? Absolutely not. Arizona's gonna stop 
Kerry Lake. Arizona's going to stop all these radical extremists that are trying to take away women's rights to control their bodies. We're going to win uh, in, on, uh, in November by passing an abortion rights uh, initiative. We're going to win by stopping Carrie Lake. I hope you will all join us and make sure that happens by supporting Planned Parenthood and all the organizations that are actually out there cutting signals right now, by supporting politicians that want to stop these extremists. Hopefully, you'll support me at Gallego for Arizona. We are going to stop this. We're going to turn this clock around, and we're going to make sure that they understand you will not mess with women's rights, especially not in Arizona. And, of course, uh, a Republican senator from Arizona, Carrie Lake, if she were to be a Republican senator, would be voting for uh, any Republican-nominated judges. Uh, if Donald Trump were back in the White House, she'd be voting for every one of those judges who has created this situation in Arizona tonight. Absolutely. Judges. But we're not even talking just judges. What about what happens with abortion pills? She's clearly stated, and she hasn't changed her position, that she wants to uh, outright ban uh, abortion pills. Uh, she has lied. She has lied to the women of Arizona. She's going to continue to lie because all she cares about is power. It doesn't matter what she has to say. It doesn't matter who she has to lie to. If she has to throw women's health under the bus, she will do it, and she will lie. And once she gets in, she will do whatever she can to continue her radical extremist agenda. So we have an opportunity to push back. We have an opportunity right now to stop. Let's not let our foot off the gas. We can win this. We could send a message across the country. Arizona, the swingiest state in the country, is a pro-abortion state. Uh, and when we vote for pro-abortion politicians uh, in November and pass a pro-abortion initiative, she will lose. And that will send a message to the rest of this country that this country wants women to have a right to control their body. Uh, Arizona voters... Uh should at some point realize this is up to them. But in the meantime, there will be suffering. This will be a very difficult year ahead uh, between now and Election Day and beyond, because whatever whatever votes are cast on Election Day don't change what's going on in the state the next day. Uh, that people have to be right. sworn in to take office. The uh, the ballot initiative has to become law. It's not it's not instant and automatic. So there's there's definitely very difficult months ahead it seems, for the people of Arizona. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, you know, look, I think the Governor uh, Hobbs uh, is going to, and, and our Attorney General Chris Mays, uh, ha have laid down the marker that they're going to protect women uh, and providers in Arizona. You have a legislature that, if they wanted to deal with this, they could just go and reject and turn around this law by statute and vote for it. Uh, for all these Republicans now that were suddenly, uh, you know, having a, a epiphany, uh, then this is the time to do it. Uh, overturn this law, uh, codify Roe, uh, and make uh, Arizona the pro-abortion state that its people are. Arizona is a pro-abortion state. We are a state that is for independent freedom. Uh, and the Republicans uh, and these extremists are going to discover that if they don't respect women and their right to control their body. Congressman Ruben Gallego, candidate for Senate in Arizona, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. And coming up, today, Defendant Trump lost his final attempt to delay the beginning of his first criminal trial. That begins on Monday, and that's next. Today, Defendant Trump suffered another defeat in court. After a hearing today, New York Appeals Court Judge Cynthia Kern rejected Donald Trump's latest request to stop his upcoming cr criminal trial in Manhattan, this time over his attempt to overturn the gag order against him. Trump's lawyers argued that the gag order violated his Fifth and Sixth Amendment rights. The gag order prevents Donald Trump from attacking jurors, witnesses, including porn star Stormy Daniels and Michael Cohen, or family members of the judge or the district attorney. A five-judge panel of New York's appellate division will review Judge Kern's decision, but that won't happen until jury selection is already underway in the case beginning on Monday. Joining our discussion now is Harry Lippman, a former U.S. attorney and former deputy assistant attorney general. He is the senior legal affairs columnist for the Los Angeles Times. Uh, Harry, it looks like uh, there is nothing between us and jury selection starting on Monday at this point. It sure looks that way. And uh, notwithstanding Trump's 
flailing efforts over the last few days. He seems to be a fly on fly paper who uh, the judge, the appellate division, as you said, are all on to him. Of course, other uh, defendants may have bottoms uh, below which they won't go of shame or outrage or dishonesty. They don't apply to Trump. So there are truly outlandish over the top stunts. He might yet try. He might uh, fall ill. He might fire his counsel. He might cause a spectacle trying to force a mistrial. All those things are within his can, as we've seen in the last few years. But he's tried everything conventional and then some. And it looks like, you know, like a freight train, jury selection is coming on Monday. It also looks like Donald Trump really fears actually going to trial. You know, it really does. There's been suggestion among his champions, oh, this one isn't so serious. An important point, by the way, in the jury questionnaire is the judge is really putting it in terms, the right terms of election interference. We're told, however, that he is totally irate over the um, allegations, and he is notwithstanding this being, you know, one of only four, he is really fit to be tied. And look, you know, he has spent years successfully delaying. He's lost motion after motion, but he has been able to beat the clock again and again. And here he isn't. And really, you know, it, the, the music really seems to be stopping for him now. And it's time to, to actually sit there. That's got to be very galling, given his assumption that he could delay anything. So we have a uh... A dispute breaking out over a potential witness in the case. Uh, the, uh, Trump's attorneys issuing a subpoena uh, to Mark Pomerantz, who served as a special prosecutor in the district attorney's office and then quit and wrote a book about his work right. uh, investigating Donald Trump while the investigation was still going on. The single most irresponsible thing I have ever heard of a prosecutor or special prosecutor ever doing. Uh, but the Trump lawyers naturally are interested in uh, possibly obtaining his testimony. The DA uh, has filed an opposition to that and certainly saying that we would at minimum have to clear anything that he might say uh, that could violate uh, the codes of the way the DA's office operates. It, we've never seen a, a subpoena or motion like this before. This is it's a pretty strange thing to have to wrestle with. Yeah, it is. And as you say, he's totally talking out of school. The important point, Lawrence, I think, is the context. Could this give Trump a card to play to delay the trial? I think the answer is no. The very most that would happen is maybe the judge says, OK, you can have a couple pages. The, the subpoena is actually for documents. And the DA has argued forcefully there are none. And Pomerantz himself has said, I have none. Uh, so at most, you could imagine, even if Merchan is sympathetic, uh, saying, all right, here, have a couple pages, do what, do your worst. But it won't be a mechanism for delaying that there. It just doesn't uh, hunt. And that's the most important immediate point that, that you know, he is. It's not a way for him to, to get out of the, what's coming. One of the things that Donald Trump has to fear about this trial is how simple and clear and easy it's going to be for people to follow uh, through the news media. Porn star Stormy Daniels is going to get on the witness stand, testify that she had sex with Donald Trump. Uh, who knows how much detail uh, will come out about that in, in that testimony. Uh, and then that she was paid by Donald Trump uh, for her silence uh, as the presidential election was approaching. Uh, that is the testimony that Donald Trump is obviously living in fear of. Yeah, in two ways. First, it's just so tawdry and, and kind of repugnant as a person, but also it really is a straightforward effort to deceive the voters. And a, a great piece of evidence that will come in is he wanted not to pay after he won, because now we don't need to. It was just in the wake of Access Hollywood to keep more uh, damage from arising. But you are really right. At its core, it is straightforward. And there's just something people are saying it's the least 
uh, serious of the four, maybe, but there's just something about the vividness and the coverage of him in the chair glowering four days a week. People, not just Stormy Daniels, think about Hope Hicks, uh, you know, who has a, who's angelic and whose testimony will just clobber him. And it will just be so vivid in a way we've just had arguments in court. But really seeing people come forward and say what he did, I think, is is going to pack a punch. Harry Lippman, thank you very much for joining our discussion tonight. Thank you, Lawrence. Thank you. And coming up, Russian President Vladimir Putin is delivering propaganda through what Liz Cheney and Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer call the Putin wing of the Republican Party. That's next. The consistently stupid Republican Congressman Marjorie Taylor Greene is part of what Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer now calls the Putin wing of the Republican Party. Former Republican Congressman Liz Cheney was the first to refer to the Putin wing of the Republican Party. Marjorie Taylor Greene said something today in defense of Vladimir Putin's war in Ukraine that she surely would have said in defense of Adolf Hitler's war against the world. Marjorie Taylor Greene said, the Ukrainian government is attacking Christians. Russia is not doing that. The German soldiers who the United States of America killed in World War II were Christians. So yes, the United States was attacking Christians during World War II in Europe, if that's the way you want to put it. Christians who believed in their superiority to the point that they were trying to murder every Jew in Europe. That's who the United States forces were killing during World War II. Russia is filled with people now who call themselves Christians. So is Ukraine. President Biden issued an executive order today to try to combat Vladimir Putin and the Russian government's attempt to, quote, undermine the conduct of free and fair democratic elections and democratic institutions in the United States and its allies and partners. Vladimir Putin is at it again, pumping Russian propaganda through willing transmitters like the imbecilic Marjorie Taylor Greene into American politics. Let's be blunt. The biggest reason Ukraine is losing the war is because here in the United States Congress, the hard right has paralyzed the United States House of Representatives from taking necessary action. That's it. Plain and simple. No ands, ifs, or buts. House Republicans have refused to move because an increasingly vocal pro-Russian, pro-Putin minority seems to be running the show within their ranks. A contingent that takes its marching orders directly from Donald Trump. And one, as one former House GOP member called them, they are like the Putin wing of the Republican Party. Senator Schumer had more to say today on the Senate floor. Even the Republican chairman of the House Intelligence Committee admits that some within his own party are becoming evangelists of Russian propaganda. We see directly coming from Russia the attempts to mask communications that are anti-Ukraine and pro-Russia messages, some of which we even hear being uttered on the House floor. During our discussion now is Democratic Congressman Eric Swalwell of California. He's a member of the House Judiciary Committee and Homeland Security Committees. He also served as an impeachment manager in the second impeachment trial of Donald Trump. Uh, Congressman Swalwell, we don't know how you do it. We do not know how you share a workplace with Marjorie Taylor Greene. Uh, well, Lawrence, uh, it's a workplace where I know uh, the majority of the Congress stands with Ukraine, and the majority of Americans stand with Ukraine. And so I try every day to separate the signal uh, from the noise. Uh, but right now, uh, what is very concerning is in Vladimir Putin's battle plans, he looks at his air, land, sea, and now MAGA resources. It's almost as if they have, you know, a fourth uh, level of resources to take on Ukraine. And that's not from outside of Russia, but that's from inside the United States Congress. Let's listen to more of what 
This is Republican Mike Turner now, what he had to say about this, uh, about the, the way the propaganda takes hold in the House of Representatives. There are members of Congress today who still incorrectly say that this conflict between Russia and Ukraine is over NATO, which, of course, it is not. Uh, Vladimir Putin having made it very clear, both publicly and to his own population, that his his uh, view is that this is a conflict of, of a much broader claim of Russia uh, to Eastern Europe, and including claiming all of Ukraine territory as, as Russia's. Uh, Congressman Swalwell, uh he, how, is, how can he speak so clearly and openly about this and maintain his chairmanship on the Republican side? I, I fear he may not be you know, chair for long because Marjorie Taylor Greene uh, is trying to replace Speaker Johnson for even thinking to bring Ukraine aid. And, and the chair is directly appointed uh, by the speaker. It's not elected by uh, the membership. Uh, and, and that's why this aid you know, needs to be passed you know, so quickly. But I want to give your viewers two numbers to think about, because when Marjorie Taylor Greene and, and Donald Trump root for Russia, they're also rooting against the American worker. And the numbers are 75 and 57. $75 billion, that's a lot of money, uh, that we've invested in Ukraine's freedom and, and our freedom. $57 billion of that has been spent inside the United States. So this is Amer we're not sending troops abroad, but we're employing Americans. And that's five and a half billion that's been spent in Texas, Pennsylvania and Arizona. So there's a real return on this, not just for our freedom, uh, but for uh, our livelihood uh, and work that's being done here at home. Yeah, that's a, a point yeah, that's that uh, President Biden makes repeatedly that uh, <clears throat> we're not sending money over there for them to buy arms. Uh, we are sending them arms that are manufactured by Americans here in the United States. Uh, that, that's right, Lawrence. So when you root against uh, Ukraine and you show yourself as a, a Putin bloc, uh, again, you're putting uh, our democracy at risk. And, and I've had conversations uh, in person in the last couple of days with leaders all over the world, uh, and they're asking me, is America up for this? Uh, and they are promising me that if we are not up for this, no one else will be up for this. And it's going to cost us a lot more than just jobs. Uh, it's going to be freedom, our standing in the world. And that will cost, in the long run, a lot more to get back uh, than what it will cost to keep it uh, and build on it right now. Congressman Eric Swalwell, thank you very much for joining My our pleasure. discussion tonight. Thank you. We'll be right back. That is tonight's last word. Hey everyone, MSNBC has a new and improved app. You'll get real-time alerts and analysis, live blogs, in-depth essays, video highlights, and the best 2024 election coverage. Download the new MSNBC app. Here's how to do it. You tap on the App Store on your phone. You hit search on the bottom right corner. You type in MSNBC. You click on the MSNBC app. You click on get or the cloud icon and enjoy it.